bread is accessible. Jesus is accessible. Mm -hmm. Bread is needed by us to nourish us. Jesus is needed by us. For example, in the Old Testament, Prophet Elijah, he was fleeing from his persecutors. They were trying to kill him. Queen Jezebel was killing every prophet of the Lord, and then he was the only one remaining. He was So there was this uh, occasion where the prophet is sleeping, right? Sleeping. And because he was fleeing, uh, in, in the course of that fleeing, he had to rest and he was taking rest. And an angel of the Lord came and the angel gave him bread, which was warm, warm bread. Okay. Yeah. Gave it to him and, his, and, and the angel says to him, consume this because the, because the travel will be difficult. Travel will be difficult. The journey mm. will be difficult. There we consume go. this. So that's what's happening. When we receive communion every day or, or however frequently we are receiving it, we are prepared for the journey. We need the strength. And you know what? He ran. Yeah, bread. Prophet, Prophet Elijah ran 40 days. Bread <laughs> fills us. It right. gives us energy in yeah. our day. Yeah. Jesus fills us and gives us energy in our day. How are you doing today? I'm great, Pete. How about you? I'm doing great. I am so happy today because I have a gift for you when this show is over. A gift? Yes, I do. I made some of my mom's famous banana bread. Wow, I love banana bread. Yeah, the greatest thing about this banana bread is there's no nuts. Nuts? Yeah, when, we were, when I was a child, I couldn't stand any, I couldn't stand walnuts. I, it reminded me, that, you know, the reason I'm the reason I'm doing this is I um, that date bread you gave me a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. That was so delicious. I've never had date bread before. So when I, you know, we were traveling to Israel and we were in a hotel, so I was making date cake for so many years, but I never knew how the authentic date cake tastes like, right? But when you went to that hotel in Israel, because that is supposed to be the native place of date cake, okay? I got it and it was, it tasted exactly like I make. So I was so glad and I'm glad that you liked it. <laughs> We're trying to, uh, we've been trying for weeks, just so everybody knows behind the scenes, anybody listening on our podcast, we have been trying for weeks to add some video But I'm going to tell you right now, super hard, super hard to do. You yeah. have to deal with lighting. You have to deal with cameras and coordinate it with your microphones. So oh, I was just okay. moving the microphone away from Grace's chin so it wouldn't cover it. Thank you. You know, the reason I was, uh, I was thinking about that bread and I decided to make bread is, mm -hmm. you know, this is the year we're recording this in 2024. This is the year of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. So the church has a three year plan, which is the, um, I, I shouldn't even say this is the year of the Eucharist, right? It's a three year, um, Eucharistic revival within the Catholic church. And this is the second year of that revival this year. Catholics from all over the United States and maybe even the world are going to make a pilgrimage to Indianapolis. Are you I going? I am planning to go, yes. I am going as well. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to be working in the, in the, in the vendor area for my employer, which is Catholic World Mission. That's really good. That's like National Eucharistic Congress. It's the National Eucharistic Congress. They're expecting 80,000 people to right. attend. I'm excited. Can I'm you imagine right. what that mass is going to be like? Wow. How are they going to Jeez. how are they going to do the Eucharist at that mass for 80,000 people? Right. Oh my god. I'm I'm really looking forward to that really because I know that the Lord is going to revive us into this love of the Eucharist. You know that is that that is a specialty of we Catholics, right? Nobody, you know, I don't think any other religion even say about this. All the Christian denominations have this Lord's Supper. But how many of us really believe that this is God, God himself that we are eating? I mean, you know, consuming. What, what a life it is to, to consume God, God's body and blood, how it is, right? And, and how can we still be living as normal human beings after eating God, right? I, mean, I have to say, God is a genius. <laughs> 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 why is God a genius? Because 
he chose the most basic of all foods to become one with, to enter himself into bread. And, you know, I was bringing up banana bread, right? So everybody knows the ingredients of bread. Bread is a little bit of wheat, a lot of wheat, a little bit of water, um, what? Yeast. Some yeast and uh, anything else going bread? You know, I don't really make Salt. bread. <laughs> Salt. Salt, right, for flavor. So, but, you know, the thing is, everybody knows how to make bread worldwide. Everybody eats bread. How many people, how many listeners here do not eat bread on a daily basis? Almost everybody eats bread on a daily basis. But again, when we say bread, it's not just the store-bought bread that we have. It could be all types of bread, right? All types of bread that's used across the world. All types of bread, right, right. But the most basic bread they used in Jewish times, in the Old Testament times, was just plain unleavened mm. bread. They didn't even put yeast in the bread because they wanted to, they had to make that bread so that if they, if especially during the Passover, it represented if they had to, um, to flee quickly, which um, when they were enslaved by the Egyptians, they would, um, they would always be prepared to flee quickly. Especially that particular night, because that was a night that Israelites were set free from the Egyptian slavery. That was a promised night. In fact, mm -hmm. they were, you know, standing and holding the staff and consuming this unleavened bread and the, and the lamb, because that was exactly what God, you know, instructed them to do. Because that night, God knows what is set for them. Right after consuming that, That's they're going right. to flee the land of land of slavery, captivity. Right. That's right. Kind of what's exactly happening when we consume the Eucharist too. So, well, I don't know. It is because we consume the Eucharist, it's actually delivering us. Actually, we are fleeing from the captivity. Every time we consume with, with enough preparation, with enough disposition of receiving the Eucharist as Jesus, actually we are being released from captivity of sin, Death, sorrow, sickness, actually it affects us so much, right? So, so the bread of life is mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, right? right? Mm -hmm. So where did all this begin? Where did, the, where did we start with bread? You know, I remember in the Old Testament, we have manna. Right. And manna was falling from heaven on a daily basis. It was uh, meant for the fleeing Israelites who were upset with God because they were starving in the desert. So they said, Hey God, can you give me some food? You know, you put me in this desert. Can you come and flee me at least get me, get me away from this hunger. So God produced manna. Actually it's, it's kind of um, the passage where we read God gave the manna from heaven was just, just after they were complaining that in Egypt we had mm -hmm. meat they had all those things and they were pining after those things. But that was when God gave them quail, quail right? So in the, in the case of manna, you know, um, uh, something that I noticed about manna is that manna changes, uh, manna suits the taste of the person who's consuming it. The person, uh, yeah, you know, how do we know this, right? Um the skeptic out there is going to say, how do you know this? That's written in the Bible. That's what I'm saying. It, it suits the like person. Like one person it's salty and the one person it's sweet. Yeah, that's kind of how manna was. But what I, what I say into that is something else, Pete. You know, what does it mean when I, I have something, I have a deficiency, and God gives me something that fills my deficiency. Mm -hmm. Pete has another sort of deficiency, and what God gives him is suitable to cover that deficiency. This is how grace works. We pray to God, God, give me grace. But even the word is just grace. Grace means different for different people. If I'm an addict, the grace that I need is actually freedom from addiction. If I have anger issues, the, the grace, the manner that actually I should receive is something that will solve my anger, right? So it, that's how it suits us. In the case of manna, whether it was, you know, tasty to the person, suitable to that person, tailor-made custom made to each of us, right? That was manna. So exactly that's, why, that's what's happening in the Eucharist too. So God gives us bread from heaven. 
God gave us his son, Jesus Christ, who comes down to earth. He states quite emphatically, I am the bread of life. He who eats me will live forever. I am the bread from heaven. This is a fulfillment of the Old Testament, God sending bread from heaven in the form of manna to those who need God most. And, and when Jesus comes into our lives, just like manna did in the olden times, he suits our needs. Right. He suits our needs. You know, just like the manna had um, different tastes, fulfilled different needs of the of the individual that was consuming it. So does Jesus for us. Right. I think it's really important that bread, you know, we relate bread, the bread that we eat on a daily basis. Basic bread, flour, water, you know, ingredients that everybody has, even Everybody can get the ingredients for bread. If we, in my particular business, in my non-charity that I work for, Catholic World Mission, a little plug for them, <laughs> we, we look at the ability for others, in, especially in developing countries, their ability to live. They need sustenance. They need basic, they need basic things. They need rice, uh, beans, bread. You know, they need basic ingredients. So bread is the most basic of foods. Basically approachable, we can say, right? Yeah, so that's what I want to do. Tie it to Jesus. Bread is the most basic of foods. Jesus is available to everyone. So I remember. Bread is approachable. Jesus is approachable. Yeah, St. Teresa of Lisieux, you know, she says like this, if Jesus became a diamond or a precious stone or something, mm -hmm. how much approachable is that? How many people will have access to it? Very few, right? Oh my gosh, did she really say that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I thought I was, I thought I was being somewhat original, you know, and then she's like going, oh, if, she, if, if, if God was a diamond, how approachable would that be? That's why God was bread. Right, approachable to everyone. So Jesus is available. But then there is a saddest truth about that, Pete. You know why? He, so if I God was a Ferrari, who would have access? <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, something about Fulton J. Sheen, he was saying, so basically Protestants do not have many problems with our core teachings, Catholic teachings. It is what they misunderstand about our teachings is that what causes the problem. That's what Fulton J. Sheen says. And then he says, uh, I don't remember who said it. Okay, so one of those Protestant authors was saying, Catholics believe that Jesus. Let's this, blame it on Billy Graham. I don't think it is he. He will never say that. Of course, no, never. So, <laughs> so some, some author, I don't remember. Okay, so he was saying Catholics believe that the this bread actually becomes the body of Christ. It's not symbol. It's real transubstantiation. It really becomes the body of Christ. If they believe that, then why don't they frequent it, right? So he was saying, if I believed this is the body of Christ, then I would frequently receive it. So why do we not receive it as frequently as we can? We eat bread on a daily basis. We have access to Jesus on a daily basis. It's exactly what you were just saying a minute ago. We have the ability to experience Jesus, the bread of life, on a daily basis, on a regular, regular basis in our lives. Right. Many is... people... Many, many, many Catholics, many, many Christians. Christians don't even have access to, to the actual sacramental Jesus through the bread, the Eucharist. Many Catholics are not taking advantage of the sacrament of the Eucharist. What happens, um, you know, I'll just say as in, in the diaconate, deacons every day will go visit the sick. And even priests, priests do the same thing and lay people. But when we visit the sick, what do they want more than anything on that visit? They want Jesus. They want to know that, that they matter, that they count and they want healing. And they just, they just want to know Jesus is in them. So uh, we, th that is one of the mysteries of the Catholic church. One of the miracles of the Catholic Church, I don't know if you call it a mystery or a miracle, yeah. it's one of the key benefits of being Catholic is we have this access 
to, to consume God. To consume God through mm-hmm. the most basic of foods, the bread and the wine, which so, become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Right. So what we're trying to accentuate here is like daily bread. It's available. It's approachable. It's not something pricey. It's ap- approachable. Mm-hmm. It's available in every Catholic church. But how frequently do we receive communion? Because there were there were times in history when church wouldn't... It's free, by the way. <laughs> it is absolutely free. And there were times when the saints... They do pass around the collection basket, <laughs> but it's not for the daily bread. Yeah. So the daily mass, there's no collection <laughs> baskets at all. Oh, there's not even a collection basket at daily mass. Yeah. See? So daily mass, why? Because Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. We need grace every single day. We hmm, need that sounds really familiar. Nourishment every single day. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. <laughs> <laughs> so that's right. in the prayer of the Our Father. And what is that daily bread, right? We are praying for every need in that small phrase, like give us this day our daily bread. Every mm-hmm. need is covered. But the basic need, which is actually the nourishment, we cannot survive long without food for our body. Right. How long will we survive uh, with with the food for our soul? Especially, you know, Pete, before our saints, they they need to get permission from the spiritual directors. Can I receive communion? It was like that, right? Right. So much of stress on being prepared enough to receive communion. Now the church doesn't say that for a couple a couple of reasons. One is I remember there was this little saint, Saint. I don't know whether she's, you know, Nelly. Have you heard of her? This little girl, three-year-old or something. I don't know whether she's actually Nelly? canon. Yeah. No, I haven't heard of her. I don't her. know whether she's canonized. I'm so sorry. I'm, I, sh- I should refer this. Okay. Because she she's such a little girl. She's three-year-old. But she loved the Eucharist so much. She was an orphan. So, I mean, and then when people receive the communion and comes to her, she would tell tell them, hug me, kiss me, because you received food from heaven, right? Because right. Her convictions were so strong. I think Pope Pius Twelfth was so much touched by it. And he made the communion available, with permission for everyone to receive communion every day. It wasn't like that before. So the reason, I guess, the reason is this. We are living at a time of history where sin is easily available. Oh, my gosh. Right? Sin is everywhere. Right. So it, the sin was always everywhere. The only difference is now it's accessible. Sin was always lurking around people, right? Ever, ever since the Garden of Eden. Right. But it was not accessible like this one. Secondly. There was no blurring like this, whether it's sin or not, or it's not sin, it's okay, you know, those sort of things. So so we need to have so much of prudence and strength, spiritual stamina to fight sin. Yeah, much of society's, um, much of the way that society functioned in life was tied to biblical principles on morality. And today that's, that's fallen away. At least here in the United States and in Europe, maybe mm-hmm. especially in Canada as well. You know, there are countries, I think, where there's still very um, morality is still very tightly tied to their spirituality. But um, it's been uncoupled quite. It's been a painful process of uncoupling, I believe, just in the time me being older. You know, I grew up as a child in the 1970s. Mm-hmm. Things were a lot different. Um, We did not have internet. We did not have cell phones. You know, so we did not have... You had to search out. You had to physically go and search out some sinful acts, right? If you wanted to. My parents used to always say, nothing good happens after midnight. Don't be out there. Um, Don't be out there, you know, doing Mm -hmm. whatever, right? Right. especially when we were young adults. Mm -hmm. But today, um, you don't even have to leave your home to experience um, very sinful acts. Right, right. So how much accessible sin has become? So how much accessible God is always, right? That's probably why before these things, sexual revolution, which happened in the 60s, 1960s. So before all those things started, you know, coming to the world, the Lord, in His wisdom and great love for us, allowed us to have daily daily rece- reception of communion. And, and that uh, that just brings us closer to God. It's it's harder to sin. We've said this before in uh, our conversations. It's it's harder to sin when you're experiencing God on a daily basis. Right. When you're going to 
a reconciliation on a weekly or by or every two weeks or every three weeks. When you're going to reconciliation more and more often, you're more aware of your of your actual sinfulness, and it's easier to avoid sin <laughs> and avoid the near occasions of sin. Where does that come from? That comes from there, Father. No. But near occasions of sin, that's what pro, being pro, allowing uh, access, access to sin. <laughs> <laughs> allows access to sin. <laughs> temptation comes from there, Father. Avoid temptation. Right, right. Yeah. Lead yeah. us not in temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Exactly, exactly. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so. Daily communion means we need to go to confession frequently so that you are yeah. sufficiently prepared to receive Jesus every day. Yeah. So I know people can't. Um, people cannot receive Jesus on a daily basis. Who You know, a lot of people, they're working, they're busy. People are working manual jobs. They're working, um, all, you know, all different types of jobs. I have a, I just happen to have a chapel in my office where they do mass at 12 o'clock. Wow. I mean, isn't that nice? And you, when it you is. were working at the church and my wife works at the church, you were able to go to mass on a daily basis. It makes it so much easier, but otherwise you have to make an effort. That's right. Right. You can look in your um, you can look at your local church. Our, our church, for example, has morning mass Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday and evening mass on Wednesday. So maybe you go on Wednesday. So that's a website which says mass times mm -hmm. and you give your zip code and you can see the masses. I mean, right from morning, like five o'clock, six o'clock till till maybe midnight. Right. So, so throughout the day, so wherever masses are available, it's listed there. So we can it's accessible. I use way. that app all the time. Masstimes.org. It's an so. app on my iPhone. And when I travel on business, I go, I go to that app and I look for a local church. I love going to see a now, you know, I'm gonna be honest with everybody in our audience. If it said six AM, sorry, I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too early for me. But in my job, when before I worked in a at a charity, I sold software, and so I visited customers, and I would rarely schedule very early meetings. I would schedule meetings for them at maybe you know, ten o'clock. So this allowed me to go um, go to mass at seven o'clock or eight o'clock. So I remember you telling me some time ago, Peter, that you used to go to a mass at the cathedral somewhere at twelve o'clock. Yeah, so that was near my um, that was near my, my my local office. At lunch, they you know they, it was amazing. They scheduled mass at twelve fifteen. <laughs> so you know they were thinking all the business people around leave yeah. around twelve o'clock. They probably started at twelve o'clock, and um, they probably started that practice at twelve o'clock. And people were always coming late, so they said, "Why don't we just schedule this for twelve fifteen? <laughs> And, and it was great because I would go, I would go to mass, 1215, it'd be done, 1245. Daily mass is about 30 minutes in most yeah, churches. Yeah, I understand that sometimes. Right. Sometimes there's no singing. Most of the time there's no singing. Most of the time there's no singing. This is, a, this is a, now, now I'm trying to sell you on this. There's no singing, folks. No singing. All you're good doing is worshiping and receiving Jesus. And then so, after that. That particular church had a Chick-fil-A right next door, so I would pick up my Chick-fil-A and head back to work. <laughs> well, that was that was really good. I remember that because there was another friend of ours with us that time, and he was saying, I also used to do the same thing. I know many people that went to that same church. That's the amazing thing, too. That wasn't my home parish. That was a parish that was near my office. That's good. So one, one great advantage of receiving communion every day is that you are always prepared. You're always focused because you know that you cannot stray, right? You know you can't stray, right? It's, it's much harder. As I was saying earlier, it's much harder to stray. Jesus, bread, I, I, I was going to go through this analogy. Maybe this doesn't make any sense. Bread is accessible. Jesus is accessible. Mm -hmm. Bread is needed by us to nourish us. Jesus is needed by us. For example, in the Old Testament, prophet Elijah, he was fleeing from his persecutors. They were trying to kill him. Queen Jezebel was killing every prophet of the Lord, and then he was the only one remaining. He was So there was this uh, occasion where the prophet is sleeping, right? Sleeping. And because he was fleeing, uh, in, in the course of that fleeing, he had to rest and he was taking rest. And an angel of the Lord came and the angel gave him bread which was warm warm bread okay yeah gave it to him and his hand and the angel says to him 
consume this because the because the travel will be difficult. Travel will be difficult. The journey mm. will be difficult to consume go. this. So that's what's happening. When we receive communion every day or, or however frequently we are receiving it, we are prepared for the journey. We need the strength. And you know what? He ran. Yeah, bread. Prophet, Prophet Elijah ran 40 days. Bread <laughs> fills us. It but, gives us energy in yeah, our day. Yeah. Jesus fills us and gives us energy in our day. What else? What, what else can we say about bread? So that was, that's a primary thing. It's accessible. The more frequently we can receive it, it, it strengthens us, right? I remember my dad, when we, when we were kids, my dad, he was going through a, a difficult time. And then he told me this, okay, he had a dream, right? Mm -hmm. And in that dream, he saw one of the priests that has influence when he, when he was a young boy. And this priest came in the dream. And what my dad saw was that he had a, um, what do we call it? Ciborium. Ciborium. I was going to say microphone. <laughs> Ciborium with, with him and that priest. And then my dad was saying, this priest gave him like 40 hosts from the Ciborium and then put them into his mouth. That was a dream. And he woke up, right? But what he understood from that is that I have to go to communion he frequently. He woke up and he had, the, he had the, his covers were all shoved in his mouth. <laughs> Probably to us. <laughs> but anyways, he decided he will become a daily communicant. And that was a substantial decision for our family in fact that's a habit my sister she works in a very busy schedule job but she wakes up runs to the mass come back and in between while he was she's driving she will attend the meetings right but she will they will never they will never miss a mass i'm so glad that's a great practice right so i'm just trying to encourage all so of how us. about this how about how about uh bread is known by everybody if I, if I showed you, our listener, a piece of bread right now, how many, let's say we have um, 10,000 listeners. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I show them a loaf of bread. How many of the 10,000 would not be able to say that's bread? None. None. That's right. None. Because bread is known. Bread is, bread is, um, people know bread. People, people know what it is. They, they have just a natural draw, uh, draw to consuming it. Jesus is the same way. People know Jesus. People have a natural draw to Jesus. People want Jesus in their lives. Everybody wants a better more joyful and peaceful life. Right. So, I mean, Pete, how will you sum up what we're trying to narrate today? In the sense, what can we do? Yeah, I think we're going to wrap this up because um, this is a great topic and we're going to do a number of um, podcasts on the Eucharist. But I would sum up that um, this is a, a very important time in the history of the church. The reason it's an important time is because uh, two things. One is... Um, the church worldwide has lost its focus on why uh, many people, I'm going to say not the church worldwide, I'm going to say many individuals have, have they, they say, why should, I, why should I participate in the Catholic church? Why do I need the Catholic church? And they've lost the understanding of how the sacrament of the Eucharist is so basic and fulfilling and needed and desired by us and brings us closer to Jesus and gives us energy in our day. They've lost that understanding. They've lost the understanding that, that the Eucharist is the real presence of Jesus Christ, his body and blood. Right. One day we'll talk about Eucharistic miracles. I think I, I think that's that's an awesome topic, but mm. just to, you know, just just to emphasize the point that if we if if the Pew research out there is correct, then mm. it's really really sad because the Pew research is saying more than half of ca Catholics, and it, I think it even says practicing Catholics more than half of Catholics fail to understand that the body and blood of Jesus are inside the bread and wine that they consume at mass. And if we knew that Jesus was that accessible, that close to us, 
we would want him all the time, all the time. And, and two ways that Jesus allows us, normal everyday people, I mean, more than his accessibility every day, two things. One is like, you know, there are many people, many of us, very common people, sinful, you know, all this wretchedness that we have. When we go to the Mass, many of us will have some sort of experience which is supernatural because God is supernatural, right? point is, is we do have a lot of Catholics on that other side. You know, we have a lot of Catholics who are, who are listening, who go to Mass on a daily basis, go to Mass on a weekly basis. They understand that, that um, Jesus is in the Eucharist. I see so many people come up for the body and blood of Jesus, and they have tears in their eyes. They have um, struggles in their lives. And I can just see it in their faces. And it touches me. I mean, sometimes I... I I cry very easily. And sometimes it just, you know, I find myself just starting to uh, cry myself because I see the struggles that people have in life. And one of the, one of, I'm going to call this a dream. One of the dreams many people have is that, is that they're trying to bring uh, family members and close friends back to the church, but they don't know how. So what they're doing is, and you know, I don't want to be too critical of people, but what they're doing is, is they're saying, why don't you go to mass? My dad was, my dad was, uh, who's passed. I can talk about him because he's in heaven. <laughs> my, da- my dad was classic at this. He would say, um, so are you going to mass? But what he failed to say is why you should go to mass, why you should come. Mm-hmm. He failed to invite. He failed to say, um, hey, while you're here in town visiting would you like to come to mass with me? Or I would love it if you could do anything, you know, I, I, I would love it if you come to mass with me. If you would like, I would love to buy you breakfast, but we'll go right after we go to mass, right? So I used to um, enjoy mass with my dad. Um, being a deacon, it was hard for me to say no to that, right? It's, uh, <laughs> that would have looked really bad. So, um, but uh, you see what I'm getting at? Is we have a lot of people who want who want to share the experience of the Eucharist with others, but it, it's very difficult for them to do so in today's normal everyday world because we don't have we don't have that same opportunity. We, you know, we're 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 out there doing yard work or we're out golfing with somebody. We're not going to throw out there. Hey, by the way, do you believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist? <laughs> What you're saying is very true, Pete. You know, if, if we tell people what we actually get in the Eucharist, what's actually happening there, why should they come to Mass or why should they receive, that will help a lot of people, right? So just as, like we were saying, how it fills our deficiency, our lack, right, for, for each people. I remember one incident. So many years ago, I saw a snake, a picture of a snake in a, in, in a newspaper. And it was somehow, it just got stuck within my head. And I became scared. So it's not like I'm seeing a snake in the reality, right? It's in my head and I'm scared of it. Even sometimes at night, I'm, I'm scared of it somehow. Mm-hmm. So I, I was praying with one uncle, a, a friend of a family, and he came and we were praying together. And he said, you have some, do you have a, a fear of snake or something? Then I told him about that. And, and he said, okay, I can almost see that what you, what you have saw. But what you should do is when you go to mass, when the chalice is lifted, offer that to the Lord, okay? That's what he said. And you know, that very next day when I went to Mass, I did. And it was gone. That fear, which was like haunting me, like at night when I pass, I mean, to alone, walk alone, that comes to my mind, but it was just gone. I offered it in the, when the chalice was lifted, the whole, this is my blood. I offered it, Lord, I'm giving this to you, dear woman. And that was gone. Just in an instance, and that was haunting me probably for two months, right? So that's that's how simple things of life becomes when we receive Jesus and when He allow Him to, you know, come and work in our lives. And I think it's sharing. Uh, you know, that's that's where, where I was really going to go with this. Is I think it's it's sharing your experience with your loved one. So rather than turning it on them. Why don't you go to mass? You would feel much better if you would just go to church. You would feel much better if you did this, if you did this. You know, it's like hitting them with the should, the would, the could. These are all uh, 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 unhelpful. Okay. What's really helpful is when they see your joy 
when they see that you pray, when they see that you um, change. change, yeah, even even more change, you know, when they see when when they see that in your day to day life that your life is better, and they want to know why, and they see it's because, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, it's because. You know, I'm going to just say, because of your relationship with Jesus, your relationship, your acceptance of him in the Eucharist and your acceptance of him daily in your life. Oh, my gosh, that that is so powerful. So you are what you eat, right? You are literally, what you eat. Literally. So you're eating God. So how can you not change over the years, over decades of receiving communion every day? It's like you are you are changed. You will know, right? It could be as simple as you know. So we'll just wrap this up. But I'll just say, if you if you want to make make a suggestion to family, it could be as simple as simple as uh, asking your grandkids to uh, go to mass, asking your your son or daughter if your grandkids could go to mass with you, asking your son or daughter if they would like to uh, go run an errand with you. And by the way, I'm going to stop by the church and um, see Jesus for ten minutes in, in adoration. It's it, it's it's not through being pushy. It's through it's it's through kind of actually showing how I, I think that uh, daily communicants incorporate their faith into their daily lives so well. That's one thing they do really really well. And a lot of people who who have strong faith but they have very busy lives have trouble tying their lives together, their faith in their, in their everyday lives. Um, and they're striving to do that. And they look at people like those who are, um, who are setting the example to do so. So how do you feel about that? No words. You know what to say about that. <laughs> Before we pray, I did want to do a couple shout outs today. All right, so we had a shout out for Sue. Uh -huh. We had a number of comments from Sue. And in fact, Sue gave us a very good comment um, recently on, oh, what was it? It was on um, uh, going to... Help with a retreat. A retreat. Oh, that's it. I was thinking mission. Retreat. So Sue went on a, on a retreat. She volunteered to help. She had a great experience with it. And she wrote us a nice little note about um, how, how, how that experience helped her in her life. And she, she thought we should do a podcast on retreats. And we, we may very well may do so. Um, I would just say I go on retreat once a year at least. Last year, I went on two retreats, and I, I find them to be very important to, as important as a vacation. You know, it's a little different than a vacation. Um, I think one thing that Sue mentioned in her email to us was only 7% or less than 7% of Catholics go on retreats. You go on retreats, right? Why do you like it? Time alone with the Lord. Time alone. Yeah, time alone with the Lord. Do you go on silent retreats or retreats where you can speak with others? Both. Both, right. Mostly sp sp spoken retreats. <laughs> okay. Right. And then there's Arlene. She sent us a very nice note yeah, about her experience of the podcast. Every time she really explains what touches her, and that actually it's very encouraging. She's one of our more frequent, um, I don't know, commenters. Right. So, yeah, I think that's really beneficial. It helps us quite a bit. All right. Now it's time for us to move into our daily prayer. Of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a mystery and what a wonderful love that we see in the Eucharist, Jesus. Thank you for allowing us to share in your godliness in the Eucharist. We pray for all of our listeners today, all of our viewers today, that you will guide us into this surpassing peace and joy that we can find in your Eucharist, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the Catholic Church. Thank you, Lord, for setting up this great food for our souls, food for our bodies, food for our minds. 
every aspect of our lives. There is nothing in our lives that you cannot reach in this powerful food. Thank you, Lord, for the Eucharist. Jesus, we pray that you will inspire us, stir our hearts, that we will frequent the Eucharist more. And those of us who are actually receiving communion more frequently, may we fall more deeply in love with you, that, that we will find all our comfort, all our nourishment in you, Jesus, in this Eucharist. But for the families, many families who are trying to go to Mass together, we pray that you will give us this grace to be united in receiving the communion every day or whenever we, we visit the church to receive you, Lord. Maybe we'll do it as a family so that we will be bound together in the Eucharist. We also pray, Lord, that all of our lacks, all of the needs that we have will be fulfilled, will be so solved by you in the Eucharist, Lord. May we have this grace to be open for that. When we come to receive you, Jesus, may we bring to you all the needs that we have. We also thank you, Lord, for this great availability that you have given us freely, that you will stir our hearts to approach you more frequently. That's what we pray today, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. So that was really good. You know, I was um, I was thinking while while we were praying there, which I know I shouldn't be thinking about other things, but I was, and I, I wasn't thinking about banana bread and date bread. By the way, I was thinking <laughs> I was thinking when you go to daily mass somewhere other than your home parish, you get to hear different voices. So different priests, and right. usually the homilies are just um, they're just shorter versions of homilies. They're just uh, little little quips of wisdom. And right. I, I find them to be very valuable. In fact, sometimes I get a chance to do uh, homilies during daily mass, and I they're about half as long. Shorter homilies are more sharp. Shar shorter homilies, homilies can be more sharp. They can be more relevant, right? right? right. Because yeah. they know that the people there are not there for a long dissertation. People there are there for the daily bread that they're about to receive. That's a lot. It helps a lot. So um, I hope you have a wonderful week this week. You too, Pete. All right. <laughs> thank and you guys thank for you, listening to us. Thank you, all of our listeners. Yeah. Thank you very much. God bless, God bless you. you. Bye-bye.